Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our today's business hour. Uh, this is the second in our uh, series, our Employment Law Risk Management Series, Avoiding Common Mistakes That Employers Make. And in today's session, we're going to be covering uh, avoiding mistakes in administering FMLA leave, one of everybody's favorite topics, I know. And for those of you that are planners, uh, I want to highlight the two additional programs we're going to have in this four-part series. On July 24th um, of this year, we're going to be discussing avoiding mistakes in handling ADA uh, situations. So it's kind of the ugly stepchild of today's program. And then on November 13th of this year, we're going to be discussing avoiding mistakes in terminating employees. So go ahead and mark your calendars uh, now and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, my name is Jim Boutrous. I'm the chair of the Labor and Employment Practice here at McDonald Hopkins. And with me are two of my colleagues, Miriam Rosen, uh, to my immediate right, also from our Detroit office. I'm from our Detroit office. And from here in Cleveland, um, my colleague, uh, Nicole Gray. Uh, we're going to be happy to answer your questions uh, here today throughout the program. Many of you, when you signed up, actually sent questions in. We got quite a few questions, in fact, and we've tried and, and done our best and in particular, we want to thank Miriam as our primary scrivener here of incorporating um, all of your questions into the program. And so we're going to hopefully address all of those. But as questions come up throughout the uh, program today, uh, for those of you here in our Cleveland office, uh, you have cards. Please feel free to write down your question and uh, just raise your hand and one of our uh, marketing staff will come and pick it up and, and bring it up and we'll address the question. Um, for those of you in our webcast audience, there is an email link um, on your uh, program. Please hit that link, submit your question, and those two will be uh, funneled up to us to address. We do our best, our very best, to address all the questions. Um, if for whatever reason we don't get to your questions because of time constraints today, we want to be respectful um, of your time. We are set to end at 1.15. Um, we will be here for those of you here in Cleveland. Uh, to stick around and discuss and answer your questions. And for those of you in our webcast audience, uh, we will get back to you uh, via email. Um, additionally, we wanted to encourage all of you uh, to continue to follow uh, the latest in labor and employment trends uh, we post to our business advocate. Um, for those of you that are not uh, familiar, um, you did get a, the URL is on the front of your programs um, by signing up for today's program, you actually got a temporary password and login, so please feel free to log in there. There'll be, this program will be reproduced uh, in that um, domain as well as uh, the Q&A, so we invite you um, to, uh, to visit our Business Advocate site. Um, we will be emailing a survey after this relative to your feedback regarding the contents um, of this program. We do take uh, your feedback to heart, so please um, good, bad, and different. We, we want to have your constructive criticism so that we continue uh, to provide programs that you find helpful and useful and make sure that we're addressing the issues that are on your mind. Um, so let's begin. As I said, today's topic is avoiding common FMLA um, mistakes. And uh, what are we going to be covering? Um, we are going to be covering issues involving when the FMLA obligation is triggered. Um, uh, Nicole, in particular, is going to be covering that topic. Um, documentation, um, both um, providing and obtaining the right documentation, addressing incomplete uh, documentation, addressing intermittent leave. Miriam is going to be focusing on that. And then last, we're going to be discussing handling performance and discipline issues, especially in the environment um, of the FMLA. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Nicole to begin. Okay, thanks Jim, and thank you everyone for being in attendance today as well as on the webcast. Uh, I just wanted to um, kind of set the playing field as far as the basics of the FMLA. Now I know most of you are seasoned uh, HR professionals and understand when the FMLA, what it applies to, but just as a refresher, the FMLA requires covered employers to give eligible employees up to 12 weeks per FMLA leave year. Uh, of unpaid leave for uh, a couple different reasons. So we can look at birth of a child, placement of a child with an employee for foster or adoption, uh, foster care or adoption, care of a spouse, a child or parent who has a serious health condition, and we'll talk more about serious health condition and what that means. 
um, or an employee's own serious health condition, which makes him or her unable to perform the functions of his job or her job. And service member family leave. And we're not going to spend a lot of time. We could do a whole presentation about the changes with service, fam um, service member family leave. But know that that's out there as well as, as to the, there are differing requirements um, in those types of situations. So the, the first thing with the FMLA is that where uh, I tend to get involved with counseling matters is, is down the road when um, we, have a we have a certification, um, we're trying to assess whether or not it's a serious health condition or we have a disciplinary problem um, and we're trying to determine can we terminate someone who's on FMLA or after, uh, you know, after they've returned from FMLA. And we, we're talking about those issues and through that conversation, we uncover that we haven't assessed is the person eligible for FMLA? Were they even eligible at the outset to have FMLA leave? So that's one common FMLA mistake that I see employers making is not evaluating uh, eligibility up front. Um, the FMLA lends itself to uh, a, a process. It lends itself to using a flowchart mentality or method to check the steps. Um, and this is specifically one area with the eligibility where, where you can do that. Um, so you want to look at FMLA coverage. Are you as an employer uh, obligated to provide FMLA leave? Do you have 50 employees within a 75 mile radius? Uh, so is there an obligation on your part? Then let's look at the employee. Uh, has the employee been employed for at least 12 months? Now, note those don't have to be consecutive months, but so the 12 month though is the uh, threshold. Has the employee worked at least uh, 1,250 hours during the preceding tw 12 month period? So when they make that request for FMLA, you're looking back in the 12 months prior to see do they meet the hours threshold? And then does that employee work at a facility where they would be covered um, under FMLA. Is there an obligation, again, for an employer to give the uh, FMLA? And then after the basics, so looking at that eligibility basics, uh, it's important to understand how your FMLA leave is calculated. What, what is, how do you run your FMLA? Is it a calendar year? Is it a rolling period? Uh, what does your policy say? Hopefully you all have FMLA policies. And make sure that whatever it says in your policy, that's what you're doing in practice. Because a lot of times, we'll see discrepancies where the uh, policy says rolling, we're, we're assessing FMLA on a rolling basis. And uh, in practice, we found it's easier to do it on a calendar year, so we're just doing it that way. So make sure that you, you understand what's that um, threshold there. Nicole, because um, I, I was going to touch on that. What, in your experience, relative to a calendar year, a fis like a fiscal year, uh, a rolling period as you were describing. In your experience, um, what have you found is the easiest um, for employers to administer? Well, e easy is a relative term, I yeah. think. Um, and it depends on a, a lot of other factors. I mean, I think something that you have to take into account is how do your other um, paid leave policies work? When are you uh, looking at vacation or sick pay for other people? I mean, is it a calendar year? Would it be easier to administer on a calendar year for you? Um, certainly, uh, I think there's a benefit to the employer by having a rolling period so that you don't have the situation where someone takes FMLA uh, you know, November and December and then you know, or October through December of a calendar year and then gets to block it with a new fresh FMLA period January to March. Uh, so, th you know, but it is something that I think employers have to look at and see how it fits in with their other policies. Right. Let me just add, mm -hmm. since we're talking about that, sometimes when I'm reviewing FMLA policies, one thing I see is that employers have forgot to specify in the policy. So as Nicole mentioned, it's really important because as the employer, um, if you get a complaint, the Department of Labor, which administers the FMLA, or um, a court, if you have a lawsuit, is going to make that determination based on whatever is most favorable to not the employer, but the employee. Mm -hmm. So go back and just look at your policy and make sure it, does, it specifies how that 12-month period is calculated. And you really, I mean, my experience <laughs> is the same as Nicole's. Um, I prefer the rolling period, if at all, because, you know, you, don't, you avoid the stacking. 
Right. And then, so once you've assessed what's the, you know, what is our FMLA leave year, uh, determine how much leave the employee has used, if any. Um, you know, have they already exhausted their FMLA leave for that year? Uh, you know, you want to look at those issues as well. And then we move to assessing the reason for the leave. So once we've established eligibility, we want to look at, okay, does this person, uh, is the reason that they're presenting, is that covered by the FMLA leave? Or would that be covered by the FMLA? Um, so ask the question, what is the leave for? Uh, and one point that you know, I wanted to bring up here, and one of our questions that came in was, uh, who, who could you get FMLA leave for if there was someone who you had to care for who had a serious health condition? And FMLA is very specific in that it's limited to child, parent, or spouse. Well, is that specific anymore? Um, <laughs> so one thing to be mindful of is that um, that definition of parent may be something that you know you you may deal with um, uh, assessing that as we tend to have um, you know new types of family situations come up employers have to address that so one area to look at is that parent is defined broadly as a biological adoptive step or foster parent or an individual who stood in loco parentis to an employee when that employee was a child so while an employee's parents-in-law would not be covered. Um, someone who cared for them like a grandparent when they were a child and had primary caregiving responsibilities for them, who now they need to take, that employee needs to take leave to care for that grandparent, that may be a situation that is covered under the FMLA. And that was a specific question that we actually received. Is a grandparent covered? And in the situation that Nicole just described, uh, on its face, no, right. not covered. But in a situation where a grandmother actually steps in and actually serves as the principal caregiver during um, that individual's uh, rearing, then uh, possibly yes, um, they would qualify and that individual could take leave to care for that individual. Let me just, you may have another question on your minds too about a same-sex parent. Um, a, num a couple years ago, mm -hmm. the Department of Labor um, issued um, an administrative interpretation and um, basically said if the same sex parent, uh, the same sex parent basically can stand in loco parentis as well if they're providing support. So they don't even necessarily need to be at maybe at home being the primary caregiver if they're providing financial support. So, you know, maybe 10 years ago before um, this administration, administrative opinion, when we had um, same sex spouse issues or same sex parent issues, we would have said, no, not covered. Now you have to reevaluate and get some more information. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples of some different factual situations and um, you know, ask you to weigh in uh, on what you think here. The first situation is an employee employed for nine months requests four weeks FMLA leave for depression supported by, med by a medical certification form. So in this situation, the employer either is looking for is this an eligible situation or is it not? just by a raise of hands. Anybody think it is? Anybody think it's not? Okay, a couple hands went up for not. And in this situation, the employee's not yet eligible for FMLA. They've only been employed for nine months, and the leave that they're requesting is for a four-week period of time that would take place before they would become eligible. They haven't met that 12-month threshold. Um, so again, this would be a situation where the employer response would be a uh, denial for eligibility purposes. The second is an employee is employed for nine months, submits FMLA medical certification form for intermittent time off for asthma. So this is a situation where uh, probably a lot of employers are dealing with intermittent FMLA situations like asthma, like migraines. Um, in this situation, uh, raise of hands for if the person would be eligible for FMLA leave, yes? Okay, none. How about no? Okay, a couple for no. And here, um, while the person may not be, while the employee may not be eligible at the time that they submit the medical certification paperwork because they've only been employed for nine months, uh, it's likely the condition would qualify for intermittent FMLA leave uh, once they do meet that threshold of that 12 month period of employment, you know, assuming they've met the hours of work requirements. Um, so what's important to take away there is that once that employee who's not eligible for FMLA protection at the beginning of the leave um, 
once they become eligible, you have to remember as an employer that now you are treating that as FMLA covered leave once they've met that threshold. The last situation is an employee is employed for nine months, submits medical certification form for maternity leave to begin after one year anniversary. Eligibility, yes? Okay, hands this time for yes. No, who says no? No hands. So it's interesting because while this person's put in the medical certification form and at the time they've put it in, they are not eligible for FMLA leave. They've only been employed for nine months. However, when the maternity leave would take place, it would be after, presumably after, the, um, they've met the 12 month threshold. Um, and so the leave, they would be eligible at that time. The reason we put this here is that this is actually a situation that came from a case where the employee uh, put in a request at nine months and uh, a few prior to her maternity leave starting, after she would have been eligible for FMLA, was terminated and then claimed retaliation because she had put the employer on notice that I was going to need the FMLA leave and you fired me before I had a chance to use it. So something to be mindful of as to ways that the employer can be put on notice of a need for FMLA leave. And in that case, employee wins. So um, it's something to think about. All right. Um, so moving to that idea again of notice and when an employer is put on notice. Um, a common mistake that employers uh, may make is, is waiting for an employee to request FMLA leave by name. And I've had a number of employers that say, well, they never said they wanted FMLA leave. And an employee is only required to provide sufficient notice to an employer of a need for FMLA leave. They don't have to use magic words. They don't have to say, I want FMLA. Um, they don't have to, they can put the request in writing. It can also be a verbal request um, or putting you on notice that they would need a leave. Um, while there's that notice requirement from the employee to the employer, it's not absolutely clear what constitutes sufficient notice of the need for FMLA leave. And in fact, this is an area that it's not clear um, for employers and where uh, it really creates some difficulty with employers is trying to understand is this a situation where maybe they may be covered and they may have FMLA, uh, a need for FMLA or not and how do we handle those types of situations. So what's required from an employee is that they communicate enough information to let the employer know that the particular leave request may be covered by FMLA and also the anticipated timing and length of the, need leave, uh, of the needed leave. Um, an employer may have an obligation to inquire about whether the leave is FMLA qualifying, but that duty arises only when the employee provides that initial notice. So it's important that we understand what's triggering the uh, response of an employer to ask for more information. So an employee, when they're communicating the need for leave, when, for leave that's foreseeable, the employee generally must provide 30 days advance notice. So for example, we use things like maternity leave that generally you can put in that 30 day notice or if I'm going to have a knee surgery, um, something that you can plan ahead of time. Uh, if leave is required because of a medical emergency or an unforeseeable event, employees have to provide their employers with as much notice as is practical practicable under the facts and circumstances of that particular case. So again, it's an individual basis, but generally we're looking at the day the need uh, for leave is known or the day after within that 24 hour period. Um, in order to request leave under the FMLA, an employee does not have to, again, reference the act. They don't have to say, I need FMLA leave. However, the employee must do more than just call in sick, just merely calling off sick. Uh, to trigger an employer's duty to act under the FMLA. The content of that information that is communicated to the employer uh, must indicate that the serious, there's a serious health condition we're talking about with the individual that makes them un unable to perform the functions of the job or if the leave is to care for a family member that the condition will render that family member unable to perform their daily activities. Uh, it's important to know, though, that 
employers do have some rights here that they can require employees again to provide notice, but then also uh, employers can enforce their company leave request and call off policies. So even when an employee is taking FMLA leave uh, and even when the leave is not foreseeable. So employees are to comply with the company's usual and customary notice and procedural requirements for requesting leave unless, again, there's extenuating circumstances, they're taken to the hospital, they're in a coma, they can't call that, those types of situations. Um, and if employees do not follow the company policies and procedures, FMLA coverage for the absence could be delayed or denied. Likewise, the um, individual could be disciplined for failing to call off. And it's important there that the employer is making the distinction between, I'm not disciplining you for the need for FMLA, I'm disciplining you for the failure to follow our call off procedures or to put in, um, to follow our leave request procedures. It's going to be important in that context to be consistent. So um, if you, you better be disciplining for violations of those policies in a non-FMLA context if we intend to uh, discipline in an FMLA context, which is always the golden rule, right? That is consistency and application um, is paramount in uh, any employment situation, and here it's even more so. Um, right. Nicole, before we um, move on, uh, we had a question here. Um, can an employee have more than one FMLA occurrence within a 12-month FMLA period? That is, uh, they take 12 weeks uh, to care for a spouse, and then 12 weeks, or they want to take another 12 weeks uh, to care for a parent, all within the same 12-month uh, period. Well, there, are, if we're not dealing with service member leave again, because right. there's this different is, this requirements is a normal there, care, but if care we're just dealing kind of with your yeah. own personal uh, serious health condition as an employee, and then uh, to care for another, you don't get two FMLA leaves. You get one 12-week uh, unpaid uh, leave period throughout that FMLA calendar year. That's correct and also kind of attendant with that is you know where a, a husband and wife work for the same employer the total leave they get to care for one another is 12 weeks okay so six and six it's not you can you can't double dip um, in that situation as well. Um, wh one other if I can um, a couple of employees who were eligible for FMLA when we had 50 employees. So we, we had the requisite number. Now we have less than 50. So those who were eligible prior to us having less than 50 are still covered under the FMLA, correct? I guess we're going to, you know, the counting um, right. regulation and, and if you could expand on that. Well, if there, if there was coverage when they put in the need for leave and the notice for leave and they would have been covered at that point in time, then they're covered. Um, and it's that 12-month period following that, following the time when uh, they are no longer covered by the FMLA. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so what should an employer do when the, leave for, when the need for leave isn't clear? Well, the Department of Labor does give us some guidance here. And basically, the guidance is, you have to inquire further. If, if there's a question as to whether or not you know, an absence is going to be covered by the FMLA leave, then it's the, the uh, burden is on the employer to follow up. And um, we are allowed, employers can ask questions if necessary to get the information uh, to determine whether the condition is FMLA qualifying and can request uh, the, the employee to provide medical certification, which Miriam will talk more about. But some of the questions that we're looking at is, you know, what are the job duties that the employee is going to be unable to perform? Uh, whether the employee will see a doctor for that injury or illness? Um, whether the employee has suffered from this condition before and has previously taken leave for it? Um, when the employee look, first learned of this condition or the need for leave? These are the types of things, again, going back to assess you know, using that flow chart to assess what's the eligibility, what's the coverage for the reason, is there coverage for the reason that they need the leave. Um, moving into, you know, kind of asking questions and finding out more information, one area um, that po poses some problems for employers is this idea of how do you determine if something is a serious health condition? And where there's a common mistake made is assuming that the employee's ailment isn't a serious health condition um, and the employer is using its own standard to determine that. Well, the FMLA gives us a standard, so that's the standard that we use to determine whether something qualifies 
for, um, a, as a serious health condition. So when we're looking at a serious health condition, uh, there's two ways you can have coverage. It's uh, does it involve inpatient care or is there continuing treatment, right? Those are the two areas that we're looking at. Inpatient care, you know, we understand it to be overnight stay in the hospital or hospice, uh, a residential care facility, uh, inpatient rehab, uh, rehabilitation centers. Continuing treatment, a little, you know, of course, has a, has a few more um, areas that we have to look at. And uh, it can inf include a few situations. So what we're looking at is incapacity. Is there a period of incapacity for more than three consecutive, more than three consecutive calendar days? And were there two or more treatments within a 30-day period by a healthcare provider with the first in-person visit occurring within seven days of the onset of the condition. So you have the more than three days plus two visits or incapacity for more than three days and one treatment by a healthcare provider that results in a regimen of continuing treatment. So for example, uh, a colleague and I were just talking about this this morning, this could be a situation where strep throat may qualify as FMLA if I'm an employee and I have strep throat, I go to the doctor and I end up being out for more than four days and I see the doctor and they prescribe a treatment of antibiotics, that could be qualifying. Um, so, you know, things to be on the lookout for. Um, another way that we look at what's the situation of continuing treatment is any period of incapacity due to pregnancy or prenatal care. Likewise, incapacity or treatment for chronic serious health conditions, permanent or long-term conditions, or conditions requiring multiple treatments by or under the supervision of a healthcare provider. When we talk about chronic serious health condition, these are things like asthma, diabetes, epilepsy. Permanent or long-term conditions could be something like a stroke, uh, Alzheimer's, um, a terminal illness. Uh, conditions that require multiple treatment, you know, some examples could be dialysis, um, you know, for, for kidney disorder, uh, chemotherapy, even severe arthritis. You know, we're, we're, this is the tricky part though, uh, um, when we're dealing with your more run-of-the-mill ailments like a flu um, or strep throat as, as Nicole was talking about, and somebody is out for three days um, and but did they meet the, re the requisite uh, treatments um, in order to qualify? And this is where we find a lot of folks get get hung up um, in terms of analyzing whether or not it truly is a serious health condition or not. Sometimes it's not readily apparent uh, without further inquiry, as, as Nicole is talking about. Almost analogous to um, the EOC's requirement that when somebody asks for an accommodation in the ADA context we have this uh, obligation as employers to uh, engage in the interactive process um, to, to determine um, whether or not accommodation is needed. And those instances that are close calls, as I think as, as um, Nicole is, is highlighting here, it's okay to ask questions specific to determining whether or not it's FMLA qualifying. And it's gonna be those, those ailments like we're just more of your run of the mill that that may go on for longer um, than originally expected, person is out, um, but we may need a little bit more information as to treatments that the individual received and or an ongoing regimen of treatment to make that determination as to whether or not there is a serious health condition. Because, of course, if there isn't, then the FMLA isn't triggered. That is, the FMLA, ADA, um, used to be ADA a lot more until the amendments, but um, are definitionally driven. That is, um, and, and so employers can, if you will, take advantage um, of the definitions to see whether or not somebody is covered or not. You know, unlike other protected classifications, man, woman, um, race, which are more apparent uh, uh, just by looking at somebody. Um, in the FMLA context, it's definitionally driven. And so we are allowed to ask questions to see whether or not that are focused on seeing whether or not that individual actually fits 
um, under the statute. Because if they don't, um, you know, we are offering a benefit that uh, they are not otherwise um, entitled to. We at least have the option of not doing so um, if they don't fit within the, the definition. I know Nicole's going to give you some examples. Let me give you an example of how you can um, get in trouble if you don't kind of you do what Jim said and use that definition. Uh, we had a case um, not so long ago where an employee was out for dental work. You wouldn't think that would be an FMLA situation. Well, um, employee got an infection. Then he got antibiotics. Um, he was out for three days, um, covering a weekend, which counts as your three days. Um, came back to work, day five maybe, um, and had to leave because of the pain. Came back the next day um, and um, was terminated. Well, what did he do? Went to the Department of Labor and filed a complaint, which I think we're probably still dealing with. So it would have um, been to the employer's advantage in that situation to ask the employee some more questions. What happened? What was going on with this dental work? You know, so that's a perfect example of a few questions would have um, saved the employer a lot of time and trouble. And I, Miriam was right that it, like moving on to some examples here, something to think about is again, when is that FMLA triggered and is there sufficient notice to the employer um, that there's potential for an FMLA qualifying um, situation? So in this example, the employee is, is warned that he'll be fired for attendance if his attendance doesn't improve, right? He'll point out of their system. Um, employees call, the employee calls in sick saying he's injured his back, changing a tire, and won't be in for three days. The employee returns on the fourth day with a doctor's note that he was examined and can return to work. The note says that he had back pain that was mild, constant, and tight. The note says nothing about further treatment or medication. The employee is fired for poor attendance, right? He's now pointed out under our attendance policy. And sues alleging he was on FMLA leave and officially put his employer on notice when he made the initial phone call. Who thinks that this, who hasn't looked ahead <laughs> and <laughs> thinks that, um, they, that the employer was put on notice and this is FMLA qualifying? Hands, yes? Okay, no. Oh, a couple. And no's, not on notice. A couple of split. Um, <clears throat> here, the court said that the employee's communication was not sufficient to trigger FMLA notice. That merely calling in, here sick, uh, I have back pain, doesn't trigger an employer's duty to ask more questions. But more importantly, um, the employee was only out for three days, right? Not more than three days. And nothing in his doctor's note qualified the employee for FMLA, FMLA leave. The doctor's note didn't say the employee had to be out those three days, right? And the doctor's note didn't indicate that he had any follow-up treatments or that there was some continuing course of treatment, uh, some continuing regimen. Um, so here, it's important, again, looking at that documentation and relying on that documentation to understand is the FMLA triggered. Miriam alluded to it before, I actually I think she referenced it, that does it matter that the three days includes days the employee wasn't scheduled to work? So for example, a weekend. And no, the requirement is that they're out more than three consecutive days. So those are just consecutive calendar days, not scheduled work days that they're incapacitated for that time. Uh, another example, however, is uh, the employer gets a text from an employee, says, Mom, Mom went to the hospital by ambulance. I'm with her, not coming in today. Here, the court held that this was sufficient notice to an employer to trigger the need to follow up, at least, about whether or not this would be an FMLA qualifying event, because at this point, it's unclear whether it would actually be covered by the FMLA, but it's certainly enough. We have a hospital visit. We have care for a parent, which is going to be uh, a covered event if it meets the definition of a serious health condition. So certainly the point here is that if you get these types of communications from employees to move forward with finding out some additional information. So, as you process a time off request, consider whether the information indicates that the employee is going to be absent for more than three consecutive days. Are they suffering from a chronic condition? Are they seeking treatment for what looks to be a serious medical condition? These types of, you know, is it something that's related to a family member? Are they actually providing care for that family member? 
So treat, you can look at those types of situations and treat them, uh, the illness or the request, as an FMLA qualifying illness, and then follow up with a medical certification, and then make a determination. Um, review that employee's medical certification to determine if the condition qualifies. And it's important to understand, though, that even if they may not meet the FMLA uh, coverage, it may not be a serious health condition that qualifies for FMLA leave, there may still be disability issues that we have to look at. Because um, maybe the person's not eligible for FMLA, but they um, are going through cancer treatments. And uh, that is something that's going to be covered by a uh, ADA situation and may need leave that way. So with that, I turn it over to Miriam to talk more about uh, getting that medical certification paperwork. L let me, before we go, uh, oh. I got a question here that I think um, will take all of our collective brain power. I, wa I, I wanna go through it. Um, if someone is in need of time off, i.e. gives birth, but is in ineligible for FMLA as of their first day missed, but becomes eligible soon after. Are we required to provide them with a full 12 months of FMLA? I think this 12 meant 12 weeks. weeks, yeah. Or are we able to back out the time already missed prior to becoming eligible? So a person employed 11 months and worked 1,250 hours. Once 12 months have passed, are they entitled to eight weeks of FMLA or a full 12 weeks? I've had this situation yeah. before, um, and it's frustrating for employers, but um, absolutely. Once you become eligible, you're... Where um, this question came from, I think you would have had this issue before. Yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then I've told you the answer before, <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, once the employee becomes eligible, because yeah. they've met the criteria that Nicole specified, 1,250 hours, work 12 months, even if they went out before that, you gave them um, FMLA, or you gave them leave for their pregnancy, let's say at 11 months, once they hit that 12 month mark, and if they've worked 1,250 hours, they then have 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had this in yeah. other, you know, kind of coming up in other ways, a situation where employer gives time off before the um, employee meets that eligibility standard. It's not FMLA and you can't count it. Right. Um, so that's kind of the bottom line. And then last before we leave, um, Nicole, employer knows of a leave that would qualify, uh, but the employee has not specifically asked for FMLA. In that it's, context. Yeah, the burden's on the employer. It's if you have um, notice, again, it's all about sufficient notice. And if you have noticed that there's a need for FMLA leave, then it's on you to provide that paperwork and get the ball rolling. Okay. It, let me just say also too in that context, it, this is a difficult thing sometimes, but employers, the regulations do allow you to designate that leave even if um, the employee isn't asking for it. Or doesn't uh, want it. Doesn't <laughs> want it. Now there's a recent case yeah. um, that kind of goes the other way, but mm -hmm. I, I think that's gonna become an yeah. issue because the regulations are pretty clear that um, employer can designate. And mm -hmm. I've had clients do that quite a bit when, you know, Someone will say, oh, I just want to take vacation. Well, why? Because they want to save that FMLA for something later. But my um, philosophy is if it's FMLA, you designate it and start using that time up. Um, so let's say you get a request for FMLA or you figure out um, from the clues that it's probably covered, what's next? Um, what's the next up in the process? Um, and that's the paperwork. Um, and the FMLA is pretty paperwork heavy, we all know that. Um, there are two big mistakes that employers make with paperwork or the documentation. Um, they haven't split them up into a lot of questions, um, but really, uh, as I see it, the two mistakes are um, not giving the employee the right paperwork um, in a timely manner and not reviewing the paperwork that you get back, and that's really what we're gonna talk about in terms of documentation. So let's quickly on this slide you'll see the um, documentation requirements just as an overview so you remember what you need to do. Um, the first step in the process when you figure out that there's an FMLA request is the eligibility notice and the rights and responsibilities notice. So again sometimes we get caught up in the process of medical certification and we forget that first step um, but to be in compliance you need to give that first paperwork um, and usually you give it along with the medical certification as you all probably know um, 
the department of labor has templates that you can use especially for the eligibility notice and the rights and responsibilities notice their templates are fine you know i prefer you're not required to use the template sometimes you know the government in various places mandates that you use their forms you're not required to use the d o l templates but certainly if you're using your own forms you should include all the necessary information and not go beyond that in terms of the medical certification well that's really the heart of the information that you can get that's to me the most important document and it gives you a lot of information i prefer not to use the template and to use something very similar to the template but if you've ever really looked at it and i know it's exciting reading the question about what's what's your medical condition you don't get to that till number four by that time the doctor isn't even paying attention anymore or that whoever the health care provider is so i think there's a better way to do those forms if you have you know if you only have occasional fmla issues maybe it's not a big deal but if you have a lot of employees using fmla leave i would think about tailoring those forms to your needs we're going to talk about how you clarify and authenticate the information you get on those forms the next form is the designation notice i think that's a step that a lot of employers forget about so they'll get the form medical certification form back maybe they communicate with the employee and say yeah it's fine but there's a requirement to designate the time off again you can use the dol form some employers do it by a letter that's okay too and then recertification which is not a separate form but you know it's a part of this whole documentation process so the form you get the form back and there are a lot of little questions on there and doctors or health care providers don't really like to go through that four page form they don't understand it i've talked to doctors about this they think it's some form that employers have created they don't understand that it's a government form and it's the government who's saying employer use that get this information well then it has to be fantastic it's a government yeah yeah exactly so you know one thing i would say is read that form really carefully you know look at what the doctor's saying many of you have probably seen this i've seen all kinds of crazy things on that form when you really look at it so don't just take a look at question four which says what's wrong with the employee and say fine you know as nicole mentioned you have to it has to you have to be out of work you have to be unable to perform the functions of your job so i've had the form come back and the employee's got some legitimate condition but the doctor says yes employee can perform the functions of their job so you don't qualify for fmla leave even if you have a condition if you can perform the functions of your job so make sure you read the form really carefully other times i've had you know you start reading the form you're like wait a second two different sets of handwriting here who is complete and we've gone back and you'll see authenticated turns out the employee added a little something to the form which would then prompt some discipline so read the form then let's make sure it's complete and sufficient complete the guidelines are pretty clear a certification is considered incomplete if the employer receives it and one of the applicable entries isn't completed so you probably know lots of times what isn't completed is how long is this going to last well how can you designate leave if you don't know how long it's going to last and oh sorry but it also it's really important for intermittent leave and that's where i see a lot of times certification paperwork is not completed as to the frequency of an absence um, so somebody, for example, I go back to migraines because it seems like those are, it's coming up more and more frequently in uh, employment situations and in the workplace is someone says, yes, I have migraines and, and they're going to be flare ups. There are going to be times when I'm going to have periods of incapacity and they're unforeseeable. Um, but the paperwork doesn't say how often that is. Um, and so now we have somebody who happens to have a migraine every Friday and Monday. And um, you know, if we don't have that information on the FMLA certification paperwork, we don't know if that's unusual or, or not. So uh, kind of tied right to that is um, a certification form that's considered insufficient. So where the information is vague, ambiguous, or non-responsive. Um, so again, lots of times estimated duration unknown. To me, that's kind of vague. Um, so let's talk about the pushback you can give because the FMLA regulations here's something else they provide for an employer the 
process to find out what's really wrong with the employee. So let's say you get this certification. It just says bad back. Well, we might all come to work with bad backs, but it doesn't mean we can't do our job. Yeah. <laughs> um, <exhibit A. laughs> um, and I see them at work every day. Um, so what can we do when we get this vague statement that makes it, it isn't clear whether the employee really needs FMLA. So let's go through, it's a process. Remember you use a process in all different aspects of what you do. This is a process too. And sometimes you might have to um, manage your supervisors and managers and let them know that you have to go through the steps to find out the right information. So the first thing you want to do is clarify and authenticate. So if it's um, unclear, insufficient, um, it's the employee's responsibility to provide the information that you need. So they have an opportunity under the regulations to what the regulations call cure the deficiencies. So you need to go back to them and tell them what's wrong with the certification, what information you don't have. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. You could do it in a letter. I personally like to use the designation form. Um, I have a Word document of the designation form so you can fill information in and I give it right back to the employee and have the client give it back to the employee and say, we can't, we can't designate at this point, we don't have enough information, here's what we need, specify what you need, take it back to your doctor. The regulations give you seven days, um, so it's not another 15 days, it's seven days to get that back. Burden's on the employee, you want to make sure you tell the employee they have seven days. Um, so that's the first step. Now, maybe the doctor will fix it, maybe they won't. Um, let's say it comes back to you um, and it's still unclear. And again, I have this hit lots of times because if the doctor didn't get it right the first time or the healthcare provider, there's a good chance they won't get it right the next time either, which takes you to the next step in the process, which is contacting the physician. Um, again, the regulations allow you to make direct contact with the physician. So this was a little unclear in the regulations um, initially. You know, the regulations were changed in 2009. Um, the DOL did get, help employers out here by clarifying that um, you can contact the physician directly. Um, and if the physician, as it probably should, asks um, for the employee's consent, um, employee basically has to give it or it can be denied FMLA. So you have the right to contact the physician and talk to them. Um, employee supervisor can't do it, but almost anybody else. Um, you see there's a list of people who can contact. Um, and you want to um, find out from the physician why can't the employee, what's wrong with the employee, why can't the employee perform mm -hmm. the functions of the job. Lots of times I have clients um, have a script of questions. You, know, you get on the phone with the physician, you want to make sure you know what you're asking, what you need from the physician. So I think it's a good idea to have a script of questions prepared. You look like you have a question there, Jeff. I do. It's, 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 uh, it's burning on my mind here this, because it relates right to what you're, you're talking about. Um, and this, this goes more to the timing um, of when the forms are due. And so an employee states they're leaving because they are stressed out and is off to see the doctor. Aren't we all? We send her the certification form for her doctor to complete if she doesn't return the certification form within the required time frame, and you normally get 15 days, that's the default, and does not call us to indicate she is still in need of leave, at what point can her absence be considered job abandonment? That's an excellent question. Yeah. I was thinking about that one myself. Yep. Um, I, could, I could tell. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. I mean, you could, um, the employee doesn't call, um, I wouldn't do it on day 16. I'm going to tell you what I've seen in the cases, which is employers who win in these situations, if they get sued or they have complaints with the Department of Labor, are those employers who probably do more than they're required to do. You're not required to contact the employee. The regulations don't require it. There are cases where employee, employers have won um, where they don't contact. But I'll tell you what, if you show that you've tried to get that documentation mm -hmm. 15 through a letter through email 15 days have passed we don't have your certification if employee isn't turning it in you're probably not going to get it in that case anyway when you do a little more than you're required to um, you're more likely to have a defensible position but you know um, each you have to analyze each situation on the facts 
So you can't just have a standard rule. And I certainly wouldn't say, oh, day 16, terminate someone. I would want to look at the facts of each situation. Yeah, and I, I think as a, <clears throat> to follow up on what Miriam is saying, as a practical point, we'd at least want to have one reach out to the employee, say, look, your certification form was due. Do it in writing, of course, because this will be Exhibit B um, in the defense of the FMLA interference or, or probably interference claim. Um, and say, we need to hear from you within seven days. I've seen a lot of cases where seven to 10 days um, have been held sufficient if the uh, employer gave the employee an additional seven to 10 days, absent extenuating circumstances. So for example, the individual is wholly incapacitated, et cetera. I mean, there's going to be those situations, but as a rule of thumb, at least another bite at the apple with, with a reasonable seven to 10 day time frame. Um, is um, advisable. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I know sometimes it's hard, but um, I think you're more likely to prevail if you're challenged if you reached out to the employee. The, an, another one I just wanted to throw out real quickly, please. Um, we currently request certification for all FMLA leave. If an employee does not want to take FMLA, but as the employer we want it designated as FMLA leave, can we designate it as FMLA leave even if the employee does not return the medical certification form when we are requesting it for all other employees. Um, My answer is yes, uh, if you have enough information to, to designate it as such, I agree. Then I say yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then last, is it three or more days or is it more than three days? It's more than right. three consecutive right. calendar days. Right, exactly. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to jump right past that slide. That was just kind of a summary, right to intermittent leave. Um, so obviously, I, I'd say everyone probably agrees, the trickiest part of the documentation is when you've got someone who wants intermittent leave. And as Nicole mentioned, probably the biggest problem is not getting um, the specifics on what that intermittent leave is, how frequently. And you know, sometimes the doctor just doesn't know, or the doctor's just um, writing down what the probably most often the doctor is just writing down what the patient says. So a couple things. First of all, you should not designate without having some idea of how frequently that employee will be out. Use your process for pushback. Um, cure contacting the doctor to get some estimate. One thing I think I found helpful is then when you do designate, specify that time that the doctor has indicated right in your designation form. So you see an example here would be FMLA leave approved for one office visit um, for treatment per month. That's what's approved. Now, we're going to talk about what might happen when the employee goes over, but at least you have a time frame and it's in your documents, right? It's not just employee, oh, I didn't know. I didn't really look at what the doctor put. So it's right there in the document. Um, then if the employee goes over, you can recertify. Um, and um, if employee has a different condition, so sometimes employees think, well, once I'm approved, I can take it for whatever I want. Remember, if you've got a new condition, you need a new certification form. Um, so we'll talk about recertification quickly. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about recertification. And that's because um, the regulations are, I would say, clear as mud. <laughs> because the regulations say, generally, you can recertify um, no more often than every 30 days. It makes it sound like you can recertify every 30 days in connection with an absence, right? Not really. Um, two significant exceptions that basically take everything out of that, which are um, if the minimum period in the certification form is more than 30 days, you can't recertify every 30 days. So I've very infrequently, I think Nicole probably agrees, yeah. seen a certification form that says it's, this duration is only 30 days. Usually it's six months or a year. How long is this condition going to last? Six months, a year, forever. Um, so. Um, you can only, if, if the duration is longer than 30 days, you can't recertify every 30 days. Um, you can, the do, regulations do allow you to recertify every six months though, even if the duration is longer. So I would say use that. Um, and then there's some other times when you can recertify. Um, a request for an extension would be one of those. A significant change in the pattern of absences before or after um, scheduled days off. Uh, exceeding the frequency and duration. So if the doctor said one time um, per month for treatment 
and the employee's gone every Friday, well, that's significantly exceeding the duration. Um, if you receive information that casts doubt on the employee's use of FMLA leave. So, um, you know, employee said they're home sick in bed with a bad back and they're actually on a cruise, that might be a good opportunity to recertify. Um, so, um, let's take a look at a case that kind of is uh, the intersect of um, intermittent leave and recertification. So, the doctor is very specific, certified the employee for four episodes every six months for depression. Um, but all of a sudden, the employee was out 10 times in three months. So this is what the employer did. The employer faxed the, employer, the doctor and said, can you confirm the certification form? The doctor sent a note back saying, yes, the certification form is accurate. The employer terminated the employee. And that was a mistake they should have avoided. Do you see the mistake? They didn't ask for recertification. What they did was confirm the existing form. Um, the regulations give us a process to use if you think the employee is exceeding what the doctor has offered. The employer and what the court told the um, employer in telling them that they lost was you didn't use the process. What the employer should have done was recertify and say, the employee's been out this many times, um, it's inconsistent with the form, and what I like to do is actually attach a list of absences. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of times doctors don't like to see that the employee's gone more than what they've communicated to the doctor. Um, so here the employer lost because they didn't use the process. Um, in fact, if the employee was legitimate, was exceeding it, and the doctor didn't approve it, um, the employer could have potentially discipline the employee. When you make a really good point, sorry, is, um, to, is that giving that additional information to a doctor because there's information that an employee is not going to give to their doctor. They're not going to say, my migraines happen every Friday and Monday, um, right? They're just going to say, oh, I've had migraines uh, five times this month. Um, so giving that additional information to the doctor is helpful. Um, you know, it can right, be in helpful. A, right, in a printout mm -hmm. and when the doctor can actually see it and starts to understand that it's not consistent with the medical necessity. So let's say doctor said, you know, there was a recertification in this case, and doctor said, no, this is excessive. He's not certified. Then you get to the issue of discipline, which is um, what Jim's going to talk about. Thank you. Um, the disciplining in the FMLA context, um, in particular, um, uh, relative to retaliation claims, which is, is what we're, what you'll face if you take adverse action against an employee for exercising the rights under the FMLA, is really no different than a retaliation claim under things we may be more used to, whether it's Title VII, whether it's your state civil rights statute. Um, so the same rules are going to apply relative to when we discipline um, and how we discipline, i.e., we are documenting um, performance-related issues to make sure that they are distinguishable um, for, in this case, absences related to protected FMLA leave. So, to begin this topic, it, it's important to track uh, the absences um, and have an FMLA policy, you know, that, that actually requires um, folks to indicate that um, this is a FMLA um, request. Uh, again, as we've heard, um, those magic words may not be used, and so there may be, need some follow-up on our part to glean whether or not this may be FMLA qualifying, um, but we need to go ahead and do that. It's important, especially um, for employers that have like no-fault um, attendance uh, policies where you just gather points uh, for absences, it's important to determine whether or not it's FMLA qualifying before we actually um, assess a point. We do see um, quite a few issues in that regard, uh, uh, in particular where employers are this, this no-fault attendance policy. Um, as I was indicating, uh, the FMLA does protect employees from retaliation for exercising their rights um, under leave or, or for requesting leave. And in, in this context, employers oftentimes are simply the victim of timing. Um, that is, I, and I'll give you an example. I had a case uh, where an employer was ready uh, to terminate an employee for 
uh, performance related reasons and that was on a Friday and so we discussed it and we were ready to move on it that following Monday. Well, guess what happened uh, late on Friday? Uh, the, this, this happens. I mean, employees invariably know when they're on that um, proverbial chopping block and we got a request for FMLA leave later in that day. Well, now all of a sudden, um, relative to the timing, it looks highly suspicious that we're going to terminate that particular uh, employee right after they uh, made a request uh, for FMLA leave. So what can we do to defend ourselves against that? Well, of course, documentation is our first and foremost defense. That is, we need to be able to demonstrate objectively um, when there are performance issues, where there are legitimate business reasons other than a protected reason, here in this context, a request for FMLA leave, uh, that termination is warranted. So it goes back to the old, some, some things never change. And in this context, they don't. Um, we need to have those exhibits, A through E, uh, that really document this performance issue uh, with a particular employee when we're ready to move. And when we're ready to terminate or to take disciplinary action, then take it. Then take it. Don't wait. Because just as in the example uh, that I gave you, um, imp imp like I said, employees seem to have this, this second sense um, when something's coming down the road and you'll get a request for FMLA leave. All of a sudden you'll get a, a harassment complaint. Um, that happens more often uh, than you would think. So when we're ready to move, let's move um, and make sure that the documentation um, is in place. So let's go through um, some scenarios here. Facts. Uh, employee requests FMLA leave for back surgery. Employee is fired six days later and sues, alleging FMLA violation. Employer's defense. Employee terminated for misconduct that occurred three days before the request when she allowed a, sub a subordinate to listen to recorded sexually explicit phone calls um, of another employee in violation of their electronic information protection policy. In this instance, the court found uh, no FMLA violation because um, the inference or connection to the FMLA was severed by the employee's misconduct. Um, also, the record revealed that this employer, in this case, had granted the, F um, the employee FMLA several times um, in the past with no prior adverse employment actions. So here, good for this employer, had the appropriate documentation, and that, in essence, severed this timing nexus uh, relative to establishing a retaliation claim. Let's go through some common scenarios that we see. Um, an employee is a so-so performer. They go out on FMLA leave. Temporary replacement is awesome, fantastic. Um, Executive wants to replace that employee on FMLA leave with the temp. Can the employer do this? Can they? Who thinks that they can? The silence is deafening. Who thinks that they cannot? <laughs> and, and that's correct. Um, in, in, in this context, we're, you know, to use a technical term, we're kind of hosed um, <laughs> because we have to return an employee off on FMLA leave to the same or substantially equivalent position. That happens a lot. Um, and maybe I'm overstating it, but we do get those calls because uh, all of a sudden when that individual is, if they are a problem employee and they are missing now because they're out on FMLA leave and you get someone to come in, uh, we'll have clients that simply fall in love um, with the replacement. Well, um, unfortunately, uh, especially if the documentation is not there to support these performance related issues, we're going to be stuck with Jane or John um, when they're ready to return to work. Yeah, I'll say that we got a great response here um, because you're probably all administering the FMLA and understand that you need to return an employee, but it's your executive or president or manager who is loving the temp replacement who doesn't understand that obligation. Right. That's, where um, you come into some problems. And, and probably hasn't addressed the so-so performance exactly. uh, prior to FMLA. Exactly. So. Right. Um, so common scenario number two, employee is so-so performer, takes FMLA leave. Work is consolidated with existing employees. Employer determines that employee's performance was worse than it thought and others can do the job. Employee returns from FMLA leave and is laid off. Can employer do this? 
What do we think? Who thinks that we can um, give, uh, give Frank the heave-ho <laughs> from his job? No one? Who thinks we need to bring him back? And the, and the answer is the same. Yeah, we're stuck with Frank. Um, it, it, now, now let, let's be clear. I mean, there, there are, well, let's say, for example, there was a reduction in force, okay, just to somewhat differentiate this example. And that reduction in force was going to happen um, irrespective of Frank being off on FMLA leave. And Frank, I can demonstrate, was within the crosshairs um, of that reduction in force. Um, I would be comfortable. Um, I like to see documentation before Frank took his leave. Hey, look, this is what we're contemplating. We're going to be um, eliminating Department A and Department B or consolidating these two. And, and this is my, my list of employees that we think are going to be affected. It, in that context, even though Frank's off on FMLA leave, we could go ahead um, with that reduction on force. Again, nice to have paperwork to objectively demonstrate that that was in case or that was in fact the case, um, but generally speaking, that would be um, all right. Again, as I, I mentioned when we began, termination close in time just raises the specter um, of a nexus between the protected activity of taking FMLA leave um, and adverse employment action. You know, one other situation um, where you might be justified in, t in terminating an employee before they come back is if you find um, gross misconduct, theft, yeah. um, but it has to be really serious. It's not, oh, they forgot to do something. It's, you know, you open their drawer and there's a pile of cash that they've been, yeah. um, you know. So if you find that kind of serious, serious misconduct, um, the cases are pretty clear that you could support a termination. But um, again, I wouldn't proceed without really ensuring that you've investigated and can document the misconduct. It's not your routine, oh, they forgot to do something. It, uh, Exactly, and we've actually, we've had that come up um, where the employee goes out and because um, we have a temporary coming in, the employer has to, in essence, dig through uh, the employee's desks and whatnot just to make sure that all the projects, um, all the things they were working on um, are being addressed and they find something really egregious. Um, you, as Miriam said, you really want to be able to objectively demonstrate that fact before taking action, but you could. Um, you wouldn't be prohibited from doing so. Um, another fact pattern, employee went out on FMLA leave due to cancer on the first day back. Supervisor said, I want you to find a new job. Focus on getting a new job. That should be your immediate priority. Employee terminated some months later and sued for FMLA retaliation. Uh, employer's defense action based on serious performance problems that predated the FMLA leave. Court, timing is highly suspicious. Case goes to trial. Again, the takeaway, waiting to address performance problems can end up coming back to haunt you, especially following an FMLA leave or other protected activity. I, I almost analogize it to someone putting on a robe of protection. You know, when they, when they request FMLA leave and they're off on FMLA leave, they've got that robe of protection on um, for that immediate time being. Or when somebody makes a complaint about a protected uh, classification or, or issue, whether it's discrimination, whether it's harassment, that robe of protection goes on. Folks will ask us, well, how long do they get to wear the robe? Um, well, I, th there is no bright line rule to that, um, but um, it, it's going to be obviously a lot, uh, much more time than a week or so. Um, and normally what we like to see is some interceding event between the individual coming back and the termination. Because if somebody stunk, uh, before they left and I just wasn't documenting it. Chances are they're going to stink when they come back. Um, I'm going to be able to document that and then take action based on those objective, legitimate uh, business reasons as opposed to it being tied um, or having some nexus to the protected leave. So what, what's a, a lesson learned here? FMLA is not a get out of work free card. It doesn't relieve you of, um, or employees of their job performance, but we have to be sure that we're being diligent um, in documenting performance issues uh, when they occur. Make sure that we're doing honest performance evaluations right. Um, if, if Sue is, is really failing in particular areas, then we don't want to see a performance evaluation 
um, that makes her look like the best thing since sliced bread. You know, because we're human beings, we don't like to be critical of one another and we're not being honest. Because when we're not honest, um, eventually that will come back and bite us when we do take um, action against that individual. So that kind of ties into a question here that I had. Um, so I was waiting on this one. What happens if the employee is terminated for reasons unrelated to the FMLA but uses FMLA as a claim for improper termination and retaliation under FMLA since a child was hospitalized? Well, I think we've addressed that question. Um, that is, if I can objectively demonstrate that there were issues um, that warranted uh, adverse employment action separate and distinct from the FMLA leave, then I can move on those. And the sooner I move on those, uh, the better. So to sum up, um, FMLA management without mistakes, that's of course the goal of this particular program. These regulations are complicated. I think we can all agree on that. I mean, frankly, when we get questions, we're routinely going back and checking and double checking um, relative to issues that arise, whether it's intermittent leave, whether it's determining whether there's a serious health condition. Th these aren't things that are just um, intuitive. Um, so again, it's a defini defini definitionally driven statute um, and we always need to be revisiting uh, those definitions and the interpretive case law to make sure that we're making um, informed decisions. Um, again, some, some takeaways. Um, uh, every situation is unique. Have a clear FMLA policy. Okay, it's required um, for those of you that are FMLA covered. So have a policy. Um, important to train managers to recognize when the FMLA may be triggered. We have a lot of situations that, that come up because frontline managers, HR may be trained, um, but when you get down to the frontline managers, they, they're really not in tune with what may be FMLA qualifying. So there may be a disconnect in that communication between the manager and HR. So we need to train um, our managers as to at least identifying a potential FMLA um, situation. situation. Um, again, don't be afraid uh, to ask for clarification um, or completeness um, when forms are not filled out completely and or are unclear. And consistency, of course, which is the rule in any um, employment context. Oh, do we have a? We have a couple other questions. Okay. I'm not sure if we want to do yeah, them go ahead. now. Yeah, well, go we, oh, well, we got a Okay, a so um, Nicole, you might want to, this is kind of a timing question. Okay. Uh, the question is, if you have a husband and wife at your agency and the wife takes time off for herself 12 weeks, can the husband in that 12-month period also take time off for himself up to 12 weeks since neither is caring for the other? Well, I, I guess it depends on what the reason is as to why each of them are in need of FMLA. I mean, if the wife has a serious health condition and she needs time off for to deal with her serious health condition, she is, has that 12 weeks available. If the husband separately has a serious health condition and needs 12 weeks off to deal with that, that's available to her as well. If they're caring for one another, then there may not. But. And if they've requested vacation and you denied it and they take FMLA, you might want to right. check into that. Yes. And that's a real case, too, because mm -hmm. I probably couldn't have made that up. Um, we have another question um, with, I think, some observations. The FMLA is job security. If the FMLA is ADA related, does the employer still need to pay the employee? Um, or is FMLA just job security? So um, FMLA and ADA can run at the same time. Um, but I thought this was a good question to end on because yeah. we are going to be talking about the ADA in July. July 24th. Yes, a little plug. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the so yep. thank you for that. Yep. Um, so the FMLA provides, that's exactly right, provides job protection. The FMLA, as Nicole mentioned, is unpaid, but you might have um, either time off policies or um, short-term disability policies that per allow employees to take pay for that, or maybe it's um, they're on FMLA for workers' comp, so employee could get paid. Um, so you need to look at, they're kind of different. I mean, they're things that seem like they're the same thing, but they, they run next to each other, I always say, but they're not necessarily, um, one doesn't necessarily preclude the other. Um, so you need to evaluate, is this FMLA covered? And then is there some pay policy that would allow the employee to get paid? Um, because it, the FMLA isn't providing the pay. If you have um, a disability policy, you might consider an ADA policy, that might provide the pay. Yep, they could be paid. 
Um, but certainly that's something we'll talk about. And one thing we didn't get into, um, because we're going to talk about it next time, is the fact that when your 12 week ex weeks of FMLA ends, um, the employee still might then um, be covered by an obligation to accommodate a leave. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's an ongoing pay obligation. Um, if, if folks have a sec, just a couple, yeah. couple more questions. Um, how do you determine the 12 week period? Is it 12 consecutive weeks, even if the leave's intermittent, or does the 12 week period, 12 weeks, um, it, that it, calculating the 12 weeks when somebody's off on intermittent leave? I mean, do you have, obviously, Employers yeah. usually do it by hours. They do. Yeah. By hours. So, so no, it doesn't have to be 12 weeks consecutive yeah. is the answer. No. If, if the, 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 the intermittent leave is certified by the, by the health care provider, by the documentation. Yeah. I mean, you might normally go by how much an employee works. That gets to be a little trickier. You might have employees who work you know, more uh, than um, the regular 40 hours a week. Right. Um, someone was picking up on my example with Frank. And <laughs> if there was a riff, wouldn't Frank have gotten his federal warn letter? Well, if, if that employer was warn covered and it was a warn situation, um, then yes. Um, if not, then no. And, and we can go into the, the particulars of, uh, of that. Okay, uh, that's a good segue to our last one in November, yeah. right. termination. <laughs> yep. these, are good, these are good leads, good plugs. Um, what about holding a job for management employees? I think this gets into the key employee question. Yeah. You know, if, can we designate someone a key employee? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there, employers do have the ability to designate a, an individual as a key employee, and then there's different requirements as to if you have to hold that position open. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know that we... We can go into that into in detail that now, if folks are really interested in determining whether somebody is a key employee or not. Right. But if they are determined to be a key employee, then the uh, guarantee of their job, um, that, 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 um, that requirement yeah, that uh, can be, yeah, can be I, eliminated. I would say I've seen the key employee situation only in very yeah. few yeah. It's situations. Tough. So, and there are more regulations you have to follow and more processes. Yeah. So, I mean, you could use it, but you want to make sure you're doing it You better it make right. sure you're using it right, and that one yeah. keeps me up at night. Yeah. And then, um, uh, hang on. Um, how about uh, certifying an FMLA when someone is out on workers' comp claim? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Can that be designated in the FMLA? Yeah, we've touched on that. Yeah, absolutely. So again, yeah. they can run, um, mm -hmm. you know, simultaneously, and you should. If you've got someone out on, with an injury that's more than the three days, um, you should designate that time. I'm all in favor of running out your FMLA time so you don't have those obligations, those reinstatement obligations. Doesn't mean you're not giving the employee the leave. Um, it just means you don't have the FMLA burdens imposed on you. So and absolutely. Then, and then last. Um, I have an employee who requested FMLA leave, was out for several weeks, and now is working part-time. Um, how do I calculate the 12-week period, I guess, assuming they need additional leave? Well, they were out. Uh, yeah, potentially a couple different <laughs> questions yeah. in there. So, I mean, let's say they're out on FMLA leave and they come back on a part-time basis. So, you know, F, we didn't even talk about this. Um, you know, there's intermittent leave. There's Leave in um, right. lock mm -hmm. leave, but there's also reduced schedule leave. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have someone who's out on leave for four weeks and they come back then on a part time basis. That's really a reduced schedule leave, and those, so let's say they normally work eight hours a day. So those four hours they're not working could be FMLA. Could be, could F be. yeah, Again, can be counted FMLA. Yeah, we don't see it that often, but it, you know, it's something you should be aware of um, and be thinking about. Um, again, thank you for your, your patience. Uh, I hope, we hope you found this program informative and uh, we'll be around for those of you that have um, any further questions and we look forward to seeing you on July 24th.